Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Holy Smokes, Cigars and Spirituality. I'm Christian A. Smith, the host in The Heretic. I'm glad that you're here. We're in for a special treat today for a number of reasons. Number one, the topic, fornication. What does the Bible say about that? That's going to be interesting, um, especially with this group of uh, rabble rousers. And then we're also uh, so happy today because the ladies are here with us. We haven't had the ladies with us at the same time in a while. So we got Nikki the Anchor who's with us today. We got Karima the Truth. So we're going to have a lot of fun. Shout out to everybody in our Patreon community, everybody that's listening on the various podcast platforms. If you're listening on Apple, please do leave us a, a review. We really appreciate that. And then to our listeners over at FAM Radio. So again, today's topic is fornication. What does the Bible say about that? And in particular, with today's topic, it's so important that um, we really establish our one rule at Holy Smokes. We only have one. And that one rule is that we respect each other's lived experience. Oh, since you got me muted. Nah, you're not muted now, see? Okay, <laughs> just making sure. The rule is that we respect each other's lived experience. Say it one more time now that I'm unmuted. <laughs> Yo, yo, the Kingmaker is such a problem child backstage. I, I really want y'all to like feel for me because I got to deal with this dude behind the scenes. And it's a lot of work. But the one rule, again, is that we respect each other's lived experiences. And that's so important because a lot of times when we have conversations about life, faith, theology, people tend to lift up their theory and their doctrines over the lived experience of another human being. And in this space, what we challenge people to do is that when you encounter somebody whose lived experience contradicts your doctrine or your theory, instead of trying to beat them over the head with that doctrine, take that opportunity to learn from what that person has lived. And that one rule is rooted in greatest commandment theology. If you want to understand more about what greatest commandment theology is about, I wrote a book about it called Breaking All the Rules. And greatest commandment theology simply says this. It says that our love for God is displayed through how we love our neighbor, which is an extension of how we love ourselves. Therefore, you can't fully love God if you don't love your neighbor and you can't fully love your neighbor if you don't love yourself. That is what grounds us here on this particular show. Also, we have a lot of fun things that we do um, throughout these episodes. Uh, so one of the things that we do here, um, because we have some academics here, we have people who are well learned and sometimes use academic words, but we want to make sure this show is accessible for the everyday person. So when somebody uses the academic word and they don't define it, then you're going to hear this alarm right here. And that alarm means that they have to put a dollar in the dollar jar for using an academic term. Um, also, another one that we have is a mic drop because we have people who make very profound statements here and we want to recognize those profound statements with this alarm right here. Lovely. We, we get those a lot. I, I especially think we're going to have some today. Another one. People tend to take shots in this group. Sometimes we take shots at each other. Sometimes we take shots at people outside of this space. Either way, whenever somebody takes a shot, you're going to hear this. Oh, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I love it. All right. And then here's the here's the lovely one. Grayson, the pundit is here with us. He's already hit us with about two or three pundits back puns backstage. So whenever Grayson uh, goes into his bag of puns, you're going to hear this right here. And that's because he is pun tastic. All right. So, if I remember correctly, you've had that one hit on you before, right? Like I'm not one. Yeah, you had it once. 
So it's not just for me. Okay. <laughs> All right. I, I I don't remember, but I yeah, I'll ride with that. I'll ride with that. We'll see how many more I get since I've had one. Uh but yeah, we'll we'll have some fun with it. Anyway, let's get into the introductions today. Since the topic is fornication, what does the Bible say about that? I want to ask everybody to introduce themselves. Um, tell us what you're smoking and or drinking, and then tell us what did fornication mean in your faith tradition growing up? Uh, so I'll start again. My name is Christian A. Smith. I'm the host. I'm the heretic. And uh, I'm not smoking today for the first time in the history of this show because I'm indoors and it's raining outside and I didn't really feel like dealing with all the background noise of the elements. So I'm indoors today. Uh, but we're going to have a solution for that real soon. We already told the Patreon community about it backstage. Uh, today, I'm actually drinking some bourbon from my Infinity Bottle. Um, so an Infinity Bottle is when you take various bourbons and you mix them together in a decanter. So I got about 12 bourbons that I use to mix this. A lot of people, when they create their Infinity Bottle, they take like the last shot of you know the, the empty bottles that they have and just pour them into the decanter. And um, it's really good. I'm enjoying mine. Um, and when I was growing up, uh, very simply put, fornication meant any sex outside of the confines of a marriage between a man and a woman. Um, so, and I, when I say sex, I probably should say, I thought of it more so as um, intercourse, uh, and oral sex is really what I was what I was thinking about when I thought fornication growing up. Yeah, let's kick it over to the Kingmaker. Kingmaker, go ahead and introduce yourself, man. And what did fornication mean in your faith tradition growing up? Yo, I uh, am Kurt Vance Ross. Uh, I'm Kingmaker. Um, excited about our session tonight. I'm smoking uh, my sponsorship cigar, uh, the Sweet Hand of Maduro. Uh, purchased here in the beautiful city of Atlanta and uh, out of my faith community mug. I'm drinking my signature uh, beverage and enjoying every minute of this Cafe Royale that is um, accented by Tullamore Drew. Uh, if you haven't tried it, make sure you try it. Um, in the same context, uh, for me, growing up in my faith tradition, it was anybody that f u x outside of uh, outside of marriage, um, any, and that's on any level, whether it was masturbation, uh, whether it was intimacy through penetration, or if it were oral sex. If you were not married you were considered a fornicator if you engaged in sex. All right. Thank you, sir. Let's kick it over uh, to Grayson, the pundit. Introduce yourself, sir. Hey, everybody. I'm Grayson. I might sneeze. I have that like urge. So if I do that, that's why. Um, hopefully it passes. <laughs> but uh, I'm Grayson, the pundit, pronouns he, him, his. Uh, I am drinking some good old two, two buck Chuck from Trader Joe's, some good wine over here, gets the job done. Um, and growing up, we didn't really use the word fornicating a lot. Uh, for some reason, that just wasn't really in my church's vocabulary. Um, but I think we would, if we did use it, it would be what y'all have said. It was any sexual act outside of marriage between a man and a woman. Um, and at least in my family context, I don't think masturbation fell under that category. Um, my dad was at least that open-minded when he gave me the talk. Um, but yeah, other than that, pretty traditional definition. Lovely, lovely. I, I wonder, I'm, I'm curious, and we can explore this later probably, but um, if y'all didn't use fornication, like, I wonder how y'all talked about it. Because in every Christian context I was in, fornication was the buzzword. But, you know, we can we can get into that a little bit more. I'll just say, say we didn't really talk about it that much. It was understood, but it just wasn't a big topic of conversation. Uh, 
Understood. Understood. So it was just baked into the culture. It it went without being said. Interesting. Let's kick it over. And again, I'm so excited. I saved the best for last. The ladies are here. I'm excited. Let's start with Karima Akila, the truth. Introduce yourself and tell us what did fornication mean in your tradition growing up? Hey, hey, and hey, hey again. Hey, y'all, so good to see you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you find yourself when you hear this here part of the cast. My name is Karima Akila. That is what they call me around these parts. Um, oh, I'm drinking um, in my in my little mason wannabe jar. I think this is the French connection uh, that the chocolate man left over here. And that's what I'm having a good time in his absence, waiting for him to return so we can partake in the activity that we're talking about tonight. But anyhow, um, in my church tradition, uh, <laughs> fornication. What's his last name, Karima? What's his last oh, name? No, 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 no. I'm just going to say he is the chocolate professional. That's right, <laughs> please. He's the chocolate professional mm -hmm. who handles his business. Quite, quite well. All right. So in my uh, in my church tradition growing up, um, yeah, fornication meant uh, obviously it meant sex outside of marriage. And I don't think that the old people of my church had it within them to mention all of the different ways and varieties in which sex can be had. You know, the old grandmothers who told you these things were not going on to explain, you know, oral sex and, and masturbation that just that would have took them out. OK, but as a girl, the added part that I got, of course, on top of the, you know, no fornication was and don't get pregnant. You know, it was it was this added little undercurrent. So I in my mind, you know, fornication was one thing, but getting pregnant was the greater sin. You know, coming home with the baby was the greater sin because it was like oh, everybody knew they was fornicating. But, you know, is you going to have the evidence of such? So I just wow. don't. Know. My, my. Wow. Yeah, that's layered. <laughs> that's rather layered. OK, Let, let's keep it going. Let's go over to Nikki, the anchor. Glad to have her here today. Introduce yourself, Nikki. Oh, hold up. You were muted. You were muted. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. It's good to be back. I do that every time. I Every time. Um, that's my thing, I guess. Um, Karima. I felt that when you said it, like I felt it in my whole body, girl. man. So yeah, so I'm Nikki Hardiman. They call me the anchor. Um, and tonight I am drinking um, a smooth red blend from 14 hands. Um, it's, it's, I've been nursing it for a little while. I'm enjoying it uh, and not smoking anything because I'm inside tonight. It's raining here as well. Um, and it's so good to be back. It's so good to see everyone, uh, in my context growing up, it similar to Grayson, we didn't use that word to talk about sex or anything related to that. I did remember hearing the word when scripture was read. So the word would be said when scripture was read. And if I ever asked what it was, I actually feel like I was fortunate because, um, my father was a pastor who went to seminary. And so typically he would just tell me in that particular context what it meant because it's used throughout scripture and it's often the context is often very different. So I do think I had a little bit of a different experience with the word growing up, but I also know that I understood that it was bad, um, that it was never good. Um, and that in addition to sex outside of, um, uh, between a man and a woman who are married, I also understood that there was, something violent about it um, and and not always, but that it could include something violent in that relationship or something where power dynamics were not, were uneven um, in that sexual relationship. So there was a little bit of that. Uh, and I, I count that to, I grew up in a home with a fairly moderate pastor father who was theologically educated that's that's good information and and for those who um are listening to this and not watching um pamela in the comments just raised a good question she said i wonder if not using the term is as much cultural 
because the the two people on the cast today who didn't really use the term are a couple of the white people who were on our team but all the black people were like oh yeah fornication we talked about that all the time the blacks so, and the whites got a different perspective on on the fornication we, in my church growing up we avoided using the term at all like any terms right like wow you don't want to you, you talk around it now in specific conversations like with women who were mentors and that kind of thing you would learn a few things but it was still just more like uh-huh do you know what yeah. i mean like in that yeah. context of church growing up i got a different education in my home so but in that church it was just like <laughs> right exactly you know? it's really interesting already and we're only in the introductions before we go further into this topic because we're going to go far we're going to go deep and i'm sure that uh, we won't finish this all on the podcast episode so we'll continue this after we finish with our patreon community because you know as usual we always go past the time with the patreon fam uh, but before we go further we have a segment that we want to bring to you today we we introduced it in season two it's called the cigar tip and you've heard from four of us uh, who have brought this cigar tip. Tiger Gibson started it. Myron the Mystic, he came through. Um, I started sharing cigar tips this season. But today, we're going back to the Kingmaker's Cigar Corner. So let's go ahead and bring him up with his intro for the Kingmaker Cigar Corner. Thank y'all very much. Y'all could actually let that intro play. I love that music. Thank you for considering me in that process. Um, it's a simple cigar tip, and I don't think many people even consider it. Uh, it's like a Rolex. Uh, it's like a custom suit. Um, it is like golf. Um, cigars are a lifestyle, and I think you have to embrace the fact that you cannot dibble and dabble in uh, the cigar space. It has to become a part of your lifestyle. It's a part of your DNA. Uh, it allows you to unwind. It allows you to relax. In a lot of the environments, I call the golf course without 18 holes because you can find yourself working out business deals, um, meeting people in areas of society with their guard down. Uh, it also brings up great conversation. And most people who smoke cigars eliminate themselves from riffraff. So if you're going to do this and take this on, make it a part of your lifestyle. Live with it. Encounter it. Think of people who you've admired and looked up to who smoke cigars. Uh, George Burns, uh, Bill Cosby, uh, Michael Jordan, individuals who have embraced the cigar life, have embraced the cigar lifestyle. So to be a cigar smoker, it changes your lifestyle, it changes your interactions, and it changes your mindset. The tip for today, cigars are a lifestyle. This has been the Kingmaker Cigar Corner. Thank you so much for tuning in. Make cigars your lifestyle. Thank you, Kingmaker. I just want to put out a disclaimer. Um, as much as we appreciate the work of Bill Cosby, we do mm -hmm. not condone no, every no. aspect of his Good. lifestyle. Hey, man, he goes along with the topic, fornication. So, that goes, you know, that's a little more than fornication. You may <laughs> all have no proof of it according to who you ask. It's a cultural person point of view. In Hollywood, it's different than regular society. So you would have to tap into the culture. So it, he's not the only one that has done that. It's just that it's connected to his clean image in the past. So shout out to Bill Cosby. I'm with you, player. Not yeah, all the way with you, but I'm, I'm with you. <laughs> That's all I was saying. That's all I'm Cliff, I was saying. I'm Cliff Huxtable, Fat Albert, uh, <laughs> PhD, Education Bill Cosby, Comedy right. Bill Cosby. 
Coogee right. Sweater Bill Cosby. Trailblazer Bill Cosby. Trail, yeah, you know what? Educator Bill Cosby. HBCU Increaser Bill Cosby. Yeah. That's who I'm with. That other stuff that we going to know. All that fornication on steroids, I'm not condoning it, but I'm with Bill Cosby. Yes, yes, yes. So what a way to get us started. Uh, wow. Picture so, page, Bill Cosby. Yeah, <laughs> picture page. Too old, y'all. Some of y'all too young for picture. Page. I know all about picture page. That was my main. Yes, the, 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 the talking marker. I love it. Yes, right. page. I know all about yeah. page. That was my dude. But go ahead, carry on. Right, Bill Cosby as himself. Bill Cosby. That mm -hmm. that Bill Cosby. Uh, so let's let's go ahead and and get into this because uh, the Saints and the Centers alike want to talk about fornication. Um, this season is. Uh, focused heavily on sexual ethics because that's what the people said they wanted to discuss. So I'm going to go ahead and jump into it. And because we haven't heard enough from the ladies this season, I want to start with the ladies and I want Nikki to kick us off. So Nikki, if you'll just help us uh, because you know, you're, you're a part of the clergy, you're well studied, you're trained, you're, you've been to school, you, you've dug into the scripture. So help us understand what is your understanding of fornication within the biblical context and then like does that align with what you believe fornication to be today will you share that with us please so an easy one right yeah it's a softball it's super easy just go yeah okay so what does the bible say about fornication well the word is primarily i see it in the new testament way more than I see it in the Hebrew scriptures. Um, and I see it in places where it, it has different contextual meanings. So sometimes it's about sex between a man and a woman outside of marriage. Sometimes it's about homosexual activity. And sometimes it's about, that may not be right. Say, mm, Grayson, I'm gonna need some help on knowing how to identify that. Did I say that correct? about the difference between like, like that sometimes it can refer to I said homosexual activity and then I thought I don't know if that's the right language um in terms of uh homosexual activity I think in this case that's an okay term to use um but as far as I know the term for fornication uh which often gets translated translated as porneia actually yes. doesn't but doesn't refer to um men having sex with men but <laughs> Doesn't does it sometimes with an in the apprenticeship with an older man and a younger child? So there's um probably, isn't, but isn't I'm that, not sure. that's a good okay. question. <laughs> and the, and the reason that, I, that I talk about this because like that um, that's where that my understanding that it can also be violent and unequal in nature. Um, I think you're on the right track there. Yeah. Right. Right. And so, but I also know that in the scriptures we find lots of different examples of sexual relationships that aren't condemned. We have Tamar who secures her own future um, by pretending to be someone she's not to sleep with a man in order to trick him into taking care of her. We have Rahab who is in the line of Jesus and raised up and she's a prostitute. Um, th there's so many, we have, uh, we have Solomon with how many partners? Um, a lot. Uh, and, and that was, and that was normal and understood. And it's, it's not condemned in scripture at all. And so I think that what the Bible says about fornication is incredibly difficult to nail down and understand. It's, um, it's very complex and you really can't say one thing about it. You have to take text by text and understand the context of it so that you understand what's really being talked about. To, to label everything as fornication is really a disservice um, in translation. Hey, I, I, I call it spiritual malpractice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> to be Absolutely. perfectly honest. Uh, Absolutely. And, and, and um, you know, the problem is that you just brought up, Nikki, and I still wanna hear, you know, what it means to you now when sure. you say the term, but something that you brought up is um, how convoluted the term is even within the biblical context mm -hmm. but our faith traditions have presented this ambiguity to us as certainty 
So mm -hmm. the text is ambiguous, but by the time it went through the formation of doctrine and our churches handed it to us, it was presented as certainty. This is exactly right. what it means every right. time you see it and you can't stray from this. And that's just not true, like at all. It's just a lie. And many people have been perpetuating that right. lie, some knowingly, some unknowingly, right. but many churches have been perpetuating that lie for generations. Yeah. yeah. So, so you understand that it's convoluted in the biblical context. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to you now? So if, if we take the word fornication, I'm going to start with the assumption that we're talking about something negative related to sexual activity. Um, because I think that's the way that when we just say the word fornication, even though we all have different understandings of it, I think we all have a negative connotation with the word. We understand it to be talking about something we should not do or that is wrong or is to be judged. So starting with that assumption, if you ask me what fornication means, um, I, with much hesitancy and a lot of um, awareness that I am in process of my own understandings around this, um, it, it has to do with um, sexual activity that is unwanted, violent, um, un, uh, and without consent, um, and that causes harm. I do think that when I look at the biblical scripture, there are other things that are referenced that I have to wrestle with. Um, there definitely is uh, information in there about um, the negative consequences of sex outside of a marital relationship. Um, that do, We do start to see some of that happen. And some of that's the, the theology that has been taught to us, and some of it is, is what, what's there that we have to tangle with. Um, but I think anything that's sexual and harmful is negative and wrong, and we have to find a way to, to protect one another from that. Yeah, um, and I, yeah, yeah, and I can appreciate what you're saying because you're you're acknowledging that you're still in process. Like Absolutely. this this movement of reimagining our sexual ethic is is rather new in our traditions. Mm -hmm. So many of us are are breaking away from you know what was uh, pounded into us in our indoctrination but many of us haven't fully pieced mm -hmm. together how we're going to reconstruct it. So let that be um, some affirmation to somebody out there yeah. who hasn't fully crafted your sexual ethic. Like that's okay. We are people in process. So yeah. embrace the process even mm -hmm. as you figure out what that means. Our goal here is to give you permission to go through the process. Mm -hmm. That's really what it is we're trying to do. But the last thing I would say is, and, and this is part of that, is that I, I had found myself in my own understanding, my own sexual ethic to really, I mean, I was, I'm a child of the 90s. I grew up in purity culture. We've talked about that here before. It's this, it was this time in Christian, even evangelical Christian Christianity in which there was a huge emphasis placed on um, abstinence education with youth groups. Um, and, and as you can imagine, um, it went to all extremes. And so I, I'm a child of that. And so my own sexual ethic has grown and, and discovered new ways of being and, and it's constantly in process. And I, and I have felt very free. And then I had to teach a daughter all of this. Mm. And all of a sudden I ran into all of my old theology, all of the stuff I was taught growing up. And and I didn't. I find myself stumbling, not knowing how to teach, because I know that I don't want to teach her how I was taught. But I also want to empower her and teach her to care for herself, and understand that her prefrontal cortex will not make good decisions all the way until she is twenty-five. Like so, all of those things are in that. And so, so, ha so I ran into that, like, that's part of that process is all of a sudden, like I'd had found this freedom and then I have to teach my, my 13 year old daughter about this. And I have to talk yeah. to her about why she wants to wear the things she wants to wear. And I'm not sure I want her to wear them. You know, right. all of those kinds of things. So, okay, I'm going to stop. I've been talking too long. Somebody else go, but listen, I, 
but I, I mean, I think you bring up great points, and I want to kick it over to to Karima because I'm sure she can dovetail off of that, or she has some thoughts that she wants mm -hmm. to share. Because we need the ladies' perspective on this one definitely, because it definitely functions different depending on gender in most of our traditions. So Karima, help us out. So presents me again to what was the original question? Because Nikki, you put it right there. So Christian, tell me again. Well, I mean, I, I put it to you like this, uh, Karima. If there's something she said that sparked a thought for you, run with it, right? If you want to, there's something that, that sparked the thought, because we don't need to go back to the original question. You look like you got something brewing. <laughs> well, okay. So aside from, you know, what um, I was taught that, you know, that sex was, and obviously I was taught that, you know, sex outside of marriage was bad and wrong. Um, you know, so I, I get married and I wasn't a virgin when I got married. You know, let me just put that there. And um, cause I'm trying to help somebody. And so, you know, in my marriage, you know, I had that, you know, the, the black church, especially my black Baptist churches were quick to say the, the marriage bed is undefiled. The marriage bed is undefiled. And I was like, well, what exactly the hell does that mean? Because I got some things that I might want to do that y'all might be saying might be a little defiling. But no one wanted to answer that for me. The marriage bed, whatever you want to do, the marriage bed is undefiled. So I was like, OK. You know, so, you know, my husband and I did what we did and had fun doing it. Obviously, I got six kids. Well, then that joker up and dies. And here I am. <laughs> my black ass is single again. Now, what I was before I got married at 20 something was one thing. Fast forward now, widowed and single is another thing. But I got these six attachments, otherwise known as six eyeballs looking at me. And these are the six eyeballs that I did a really good job training and bringing up in the evangelical church. Now, my daughter, oldest one at the time, she was fifth, she was 16. She was 16. And um, after my husband died, I didn't have my first relationship until maybe a couple years later, maybe three, four years later. I'm going to say it like this, that I brought home to the children. But that's a whole nother discussion for a whole nother time. Anyhow, check this out. And if my my daughter, my baby, if you ever hear this, you know, you this is this is to help somebody else, okay? And when you get to be 40 something years old, then you can appreciate it. But my daughter pulls me up and she says, "Mom, um, you know, you stayed you stayed over at such and such's house." Here she go. Cuz Nikki, I did that whole purity culture thing, right? I did that thing and I did it well. Here she go. But there were no chaperones. What? What say? No, there ain't no chaperones, boo. We ain't got yeah. no grown ass woman. I ain't got no damn chaperone. You need a chaperone? Come on now. Because that's what their purity culture says. Their purity culture says that if you are not married and you are a female with a male, you need to have yourself a chaperone, a Google chaperone, so that don't nothing happen. And right there, I had to break it down to her. I had to say, let me let me explain who your mama is. Let me explain who she was before she married your father. Let me, and I'm a, I'm a, I'm gonna bring it all the way home. Let me explain that the my very first sexual encounter wasn't consensual. And let me, if we're gonna be real, we're gonna be real. We're gonna tell it. We're gonna tell it. And let me tell you what that created in me. Let me tell you the appetite that that created in me before I even knew what a sexual appetite was. And let me tell you how your father and my marriage to him kept me from, as they say in the church, being a whoremonger, <laughs> if you will. Or I guess I would be the whore and the man would be the whoremonger. I guess that's how that works. And let me tell you how, <laughs> what I wanted to say is best be glad that it's this one man here. All right. So when we put it like that, <laughs> when you put it in that context, you know, now we have degrees and levels to this thing called immorality, right? And so which one is more immoral? The fact that your mama out here home with a couple of dudes or that she over here giving it to one. And so now, you know, on this side of 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 marriage and on this side of my own spiritual growth and development, what I'm understanding is, you know, you're right, Nikki, there's there's a new context um, to this conversation for me. And it's one that I'm sure my my baby girl at 16, she might not have been ready to hear. But if you're grown enough to ask it, then you're grown enough to hear the real answer. So and that's why we love you. And 
that is why we love you. That right there. I think it's really interesting um, when we talk about fornication from the perspective that Nikki shared, right? That it, it um, fornication based on her working definition now is that it's something that um, can contain violence or is an imposition on somebody um, does not come with consent, then based on that definition, which I think is a viable definition, what happened to you um, that started your sexual journey was fornication. Like the stuff you've done since then where it was consensual and mutual and everybody benefited from it, right. that's not really fornication if we're talking about harm being caused. Uh, right. But really the, the fornication was in is in the sexual assault, it's in the molestation, it's in the rape, it's in imposing one's will on somebody else rather than just two grown ass people getting together in a consensual relationship and expressing themselves sexually, uh, which, is, which is very different um, than what most churches will allow. And before we, before we go to the Kingmaker, I see Nikki has her hand up. So Nikki, go ahead and drop it real quick and then we wanna go to the Kingmaker. Oh, you gotta unmute yourself. You gotta unmute yourself. I was almost there. I almost did it. I just want to add that what you said about violent acts is absolutely true, but it also can be knowingly engaging in a consensual activity when you know there's a different level of commitment or a different level of interest. Like I think that I think that that can have the potential to cause harm. Uh, to another. And so I, I think like we can think about these these very blatantly violent acts. But I think one of the things that's important in order to, for me, to honor my own tradition and what I understand is that, that it's not just about these active, um, active acts of violence, but it can also be about flippantly engaging without considering the other person. That, so that's so I point. just wanted to, to bring that layer in. That's all. Now, and that's a great point. And it makes sense um, because in the, the gender dynamics of heterosexual relationships, a lot of times men are guilty of uh, lying to women, taking advantage of their trust to get the sex. Sure. Sure. So, yes, that is that is a a betrayal of trust. It is it is violent emotionally to do that. So I, I totally agree with what you're saying. Okay. Kingmaker, what are your thoughts, man? Because this has already gotten heavy. Um, and, and looking at it in its etymology, both Greek and in Hebrew, of course. You're going gonna, you're gonna to give me for etymology? You got to remember, Big Sexy is back there doing the dollar jar. So you got to come correct because Big Sexy not letting any words go. So explain what etymology means. In, in the root vernacular or the root language that this word is derived from, um, you got two components. Uh, Grayson and Nikki have shared that, that in the New Testament, you have the Greek uh, porneia which has such a vast definition. Um, when, you look, when you look at porneia, it can be consensual sex between two people. It can be illicit sex between two people. It can even go as far as being incest. Uh, so you got a broad definition of porneia in Greek. When you see it, the times it shows up in Hebrew, uh, you see this term zene, uh, which really implies committing adultery, which now makes it even murkier. And they go as far as to talk about prostitution or being a whore. So you have these two dynamics that use the same term, one extremely broad and positive with peppered negativity and one that just gives you an illicit paid for negative context. For me, that's not the real concern. The critical question is context in the current age, uh, simply because of the fact that 
lying has the same implication um, because you can lie offensively just like you can lie defensively. Lying can be a protector and it can be a, a protagonist. Um, you can, you've heard old people say if you're lying, I get him out from back there because this is the foolishness. I'm sick of it already. He's fornicating against my vocabulary and I don't like it. I'm sick of this now. He's violently um, imposing himself on your vocabulary. Yeah, yeah man. He's imposing himself. Um, this is the challenge for me uh, because if I take certain portions of this in context, in the Hebrew, there are blessings, benefits, and spiritual context connected to it. If I take it in the Greek, it literally can be confusing based off of the crowd you're talking to. In the here and now, I'm not so concerned about what fornication meant as much as I am focused on how we define our perspective of morality in the day and time that we live in. Because of course, with every time frame, things change. The way we define homosexuality in the 17th century, we don't define it in the 21st century. Uh, the way we define divorce in the, in the 19th century is totally different. And I think the mistake we make is that we freeze terminologies that make us uncomfortable and make them fit today in a way that they, not, they don't fit but they match what happened in yesterday. I think we got to get off of what is fornication, how bad is it, should you do it, and understand that every circumstance with more information and more clarity gives us a more open mind to it. You got a more closed-minded group of people uh, in the Bible days than you have here. And we can't forget, we weren't there. So their definitions are being transliterated or changed, adjusted based off of who's talking, who's experiencing it and who's going through it. So to understand what Karima is talking about, to just say fornication is bad when somebody turned on her sexual timer too early, this is bigger than fornication. This is somebody that dealing with a sick psychology and to just label it as fornication to me minimizes the wrong, but to not say that because I'm 40 years old and widowed and I don't want to stay uh, locked up by my sexuality and I'm going to hell because the Bible says it is just as crazy as you would be able to label somebody who is sick in their circumstance. So I think we've got to now look at context more than we look at definition. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, so and and this is this is going in incredibly well uh believe it or not we have about 13 more minutes so i want to hear from the pundit uh before we go further and get people's uh final thoughts for the official episode and we'll keep this going in the after party pundit what you got so it sounds to me like the the definition we're working with with fornication and i agree with what nikki I, I agree with what everybody has said um has less to do with marriage uh and more to do with boundaries of which marriage is one so i think it's always been about boundaries but we're just naming it we're making it plain as such um because marriage is an imposed boundary right it is this is the box that we can put around right sexuality um and then we can draw a binary and make this the good box the good place and everything outside of it the bad place um and then we can control the original means of production which is baby making and therefore control a population um so when you start to m mess with those boundaries clear those boundaries and this goes into last week's conversation so if it is marriage okay, then what are the genders involved? Okay, well, it has to be a man and a woman, but how many? Okay, just two. Um, but once you start to expand it, then it has to become about something other than that one boundary. 
Because if it is two people, then polyamorous relationships can be having sex with other people outside of that primary relationship. But it's not fornication because they have created boundaries that are more fluid, that are more negotiable. Um, and so I think the, the idea of boundaries then makes me, you know, just for who I am, question the definition of fornication. Because if you take that definition as the only boundary it applies to is this construct of marriage, which is imposed on people, um, then no queer person, all queer sex was fornication before 2015, even if you affirm queer sexuality, because we couldn't get married <laughs> um, in this country, at least, and in most countries around the world still. So it's like, okay, so fornication is determined by whether or not the state affirms a marriage as a marriage. Are we giving too much power to the state then? Are we giving more power to the state than to God that once the governor signs the marriage certificate, then it becomes okay in God's eyes? Actually, I actually will, will say this, that for most religious traditions, Grayson, they don't recognize a marriage between two people of the same gender. So that doesn't even matter that that mm -hmm. the, the state acknowledges or affirms. The church is like, no, we're not affirming that. So as far as the church is concerned, I don't care if the state acknowledges your marriage. It's still perversion. It's still uh, fornication. It's still all of the bad stuff. So and and, and that's because sometimes the, the church wants to be in bed with the state. And sometimes it wants to be separated from the state, depending on convenience. But that's just something I thought I'd throw in. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, you're good. And that's and that's a good point. So that I was getting to what it means to me, because you're very right. Like, it, it's a moot point that um, churches wouldn't recognize any marriage other than a man or a woman, regardless of what the state says. And the fact that the state is affirming it is how we get uh, Kim Davises of the world, who are heroes for denying marriage licenses. Um, but for me personally, I can't believe in that definition of fornication because, again, it wasn't until six years ago that I could even think about that definition at all um, beyond it just being a given that any sex I would have or not have would be fornication. Um, and so for me, yeah, it does have to do with having rela having sexual relationships that are not in keeping with the boundaries that you have set up for yourself that you have set up with your partner or partners and that you have set up with the religious system or philosophical system that you're a part of. Um, and I think that's where we get the harm is when those boundaries are violated. But it doesn't mean that the boundaries are irreparably or uh, not able to be repaired, broken, because we can renegotiate and we can, we can mend fences and we can heal. Um, but I do think that when you have the reality of queer people, um, who have been denied marriage um, in a state sense, then you have to think about, uh, well, then can it be more about uh, breaking covenant? Can it be more about breaking values? Can it be more about um, breaking uh, promises? Anything like that. And those are much more difficult questions that we have to wrestle with than, well, when Brian Kemp signs a certificate, then you can fuck. Okay, we'll just go ahead and close it out like that. Thank you very much, Grayson Hester, the pundit. <laughs> I'm glad um, we got our first couple of episodes out of the way to establish um, the the rating of this show. Because if this was the first episode ever, we would have got a, a, a mature audience only rating. <laughs> All right, so we're going to continue this afterwards, but I, I want to share a couple of things and then I want to get everybody to give us like 60 seconds of your final thoughts. And then we'll go to the after party with the Patreon community. So fornication in the biblical context is convoluted. We have formulated doctrines that have tried to make it certain and very absolute, but that's not what we see in scripture. So if a church is saying we just go by what the Bible says, but they they narrow down fornication to just sex between somebody outside of the confines of marriage, well, then um, that's actually not true that they're going by what the Bible says. So the way I look at it and the way we practice our moral reasoning, there are two ways you can look at moral reasoning. 
And I'm going to define these words. You have, well, there, there are a number of ways, two ways I want to point out uh, that are at question right here are the concept of deontology and teleology. Deontology is a philosophical concept where that deals with duty and making a moral decision. What is your duty? What is universally right? What are your intentions? So regardless of the consequences of that action, what were the intentions of the action? What was the rule you were supposed to follow? On the other end of the spectrum, you have teleology, which is not concerned with the duty or the intentions, but merely the consequences, regardless of what your intentions were, regardless of what is supposed to be right. We don't care. We just care about the outcome, the consequences. And a lot of people think that our ministry deals in teleology. Oh, forget the rules. Forget what the Bible says. Just do whatever you want to do as long as everybody is happy. That's not what we're doing. But what the church does and its approach to scripture is deontological, deontology. It says, look, the Bible says it. That's the rule. It's our duty to follow it. Right. And I'm suggesting that we don't use either. We don't use either approach, but we take a combination of the two of them and look at what the Bible says and then question why the Bible says that and then use our own moral reasoning to figure out an ethic that works for us in our context. So when we look at the scriptures and what it says about different topics like fornication, deontology says, um, you know, that's what it says and that settles it. Teleology says, I don't care what it says. I'm suggesting that we use a hybrid that asks the question, why does it say what it says? So it's not, that's what it says, no questions asked, or I don't care what it says, but why does it say what it says? And I believe that will help us to determine a healthy sexual ethic for people as we navigate our lives. Uh, so th that's kind of where I'm coming from in my uh, crafting of a sexual ethic and talking about fornication. Sure, the Bible says what it says. Now let's start asking the question, why? And determine, does their why align with our why? And it generally does not. So that's what's really important to me. We, we're going to have to end here in like four and a half minutes. So I want each of you to give me 45 seconds of your final thoughts and then we'll we'll do the after party. Um, I'm going to start uh, with, with Nikki and then I'm going to go to Curvance and then I'm gonna go to Grayson and I'm gonna finish it off with the truth. Give me 45 seconds. I know that's hard, but give me the best shot you have at 45 seconds. Nikki, anchor us, let's go. You gotta unmute yourself <laughs> every time. Okay, it's becoming ridiculous. Um, okay, um, 45 seconds. I don't know if I can do this in 45 seconds. I would. I wanted to respond to Curvance. Um, Curvance talked about the importance of understanding the context in which the scriptures that we're reading, um, in which they were written. And he was basically giving us some of that teleology that understanding the why of which the context is. I, I hope that's what you said because that's what I heard. Uh, and then looking at our context today, today and see where there's a line. I, for me, I go to Acts 15 because in Acts 15, you have James, Peter, and Paul. It's the only place in scripture when all three of these men are together to make a decision together. And in this decision, they, they say, James is the one who says it, but the other two back him up. They say that it's okay for Gentiles to come into the church and not be circumcised. And this is a really important decision in the early church that happens. It, it shows a dramatic shift um, in, in, in how it goes. And essentially what James says is, he says, I have reached the decision that we should not trouble those Gentiles who are turning to God. So James says, there are aspects of our faith that we practice that are important to us, but they are not consequential to faith. They help us practice our faith because that's what we've been taught. But these Gentiles are coming to God. So let us not turn them away if they don't want to be circumcised. 
And so I think here in Acts 15, these three men who are pillars of the church in their own right have set up for us a, a, a way in which we can respond to the culture in which we live faithfully. Uh, they have set up for us a way to continue to honor those parts of our practice that matter to us and have nurtured us along the way and understand that the people who join with us may not need those same practices. They may experience God in different ways. Okay. I don't think I did 45 seconds, but there, I'm done. All right. Okay, yes. I so I got to give no. shout out to Dan B. Wait, wait, wait. Before you do anything else, we only got a minute and a half. So I, I'm going to kick it over to Karima because I want to let the ladies speak today. And then the rest of us will be able to talk in the after party. Karima, give us give us 60 seconds and we're going to get out of here. Everything that Nikki said, every single last thing that she said and that passage of scripture, I remember studying that it was as if they had to come to a new covenant. They had to come to a new understanding based upon what was right in front of them. And that is where I feel like I know I am personally in the area of sexuality. I'm not married anymore. And what, what, what are my options? And so in that understanding, I had to come to a new understanding with God, one that would allow me to still be in relationship with him and still be true to what I knew I was going to do. Right. So why, why fake the funk, as we used to say. Right. So I would have been um, out of integrity. If I told God one thing, but then did another, but instead in my relationship and honoring who God is in my life, I said, now, God, you know me, <laughs> you know me, you know, from whence I've come and you know what I'm capable of. So to make sure that I still honor you and my commitment to you, this is what we're going to do. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for sharing that. Listen, for those who are listening on the podcast platform, there's definitely more for us to cover, but we don't have time to cover it right here. So uh, join us next time. Our next topic is should black people be Christians featuring Stephen J. Thurston II. We'll see y'all next time. Peace out.